beautiful friends, and welcome to another episode of Still the Fat Kid podcast, where we are going to try to bring you the best actions and strategies so that you too can prove the struggle is real, but you are stronger. Today's guest is my philosophical brother, <laughs> one of my real good friends. We've gotten really closer in the last uh, month or so, um, just because we share a lot of ideas back and forth. But Brian Brown, um, wow, does he have a story to tell you? He comes from you know, background of doing this, doing that. He's learned so much. Um, just a great, you know, knowledge of wisdom that we're trying to get him to come out a little more and, and speak a little more about. Um, but I always like to start off with a few questions. Um, just kind of get things going. Ron, what's something that you're grateful for? Well, I'm actually grateful for the fact that I got 36 years. I guess you said my grandmother passed away and 2006 of uh, cancer. So I'm grateful that I got to spend those 36 years because, you know, I wouldn't have developed certain, I guess you'd say, we were talking about coping skills and, mm-hmm. and ability to do that. So I'm grateful for that. That is one thing I'm truly grateful for. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we learn those lessons from different points in life and from different people. Yeah. Um, so it's great that you're grateful for that person being in your life. Mm-hmm. When is the last time you've laughed out loud? I try to do it every day. Good. <laughs> After, you know, I guess it was uh, Jim Vavana. Mm-hmm. And he had that uh, speech in his battle with cancer. But, you know, it's like you, you know, should laugh and cry every day. And um, I'm fortunate enough, some of the people that I work with, I you know, every day I go in and now I can find them texting me. <laughs> and I'm busting out laughing in the middle of something, you know, and it's... Uh, it's a wonderful feeling, you know, but it's, it's a, I thought it laughed, it hurts. Good, good, good. You gotta, you gotta enjoy life. Yeah. All right. If you had a walkout song for life, you know, like the baseball walkout song you went up to bat with, what would it be? Oh my goodness. <laughs> what would be a walkout song? Jeez. I was coaching at, uh, Georgia at one point, and a, a, a closer would come out to enter the Sandman. Mm-hmm. But um, maybe uh, how about uh, T.I. and Justin Timberlake's uh, Dead and Gone? I like it. Yeah, maybe that would be the. I like. I, I, I could see that, that fitting you. Yeah, it's like your your you know, pieces of you, you know, slowly as you evolve, pieces mm-hmm. of you just kind of peel off and go on to it. And it was needed then, but it's not needed anymore. So that part of you is dead and gone. Exactly. And you're trying to get home. So, you know. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Awesome. Well, I feel like I already know the answer to this question, <laughs> but who is someone that you grew up looking up to? Again, my grandmother. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it, you know, there it's also my mother. You know, being raised with a single parent, um, I consider my mother to be like a, uh, how do you say, a rolling stone. I mean, you know, she she uh, she adapted to situations and she improvised and she did whatever she had to do to make sure that we were fed. And uh, my grandmother was like that rock. Everything yeah. that, you know, she was like a security blanket. You know, even though she, you know, raised in the South, born in the greatest generation, I guess they call that generation, but she, those two, you know, and it's funny that I have, you know, women as these, you know, um, being my, you know, the rock or the foundation which I've built up, which goes back to that old proverb, a Mexican proverb, that the foundation of a house is not built up on land, but built on the back of a woman. So I, I, uh, I kind of look back to that because, you know, certain things you wouldn't be empathetic to without that, mm-hmm. without that background or without that, I guess you say, without that structure that I had. Yeah. Absolutely, man. I, mean, I know that you know, my mom's played a large role in my life. I've seen the way she's interacted with people and the way she's led people. You know, she's a high school basketball coach, so I see the interaction she's always had. So, I mean, I definitely understand that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it helps seeing that side. As long as we understand the role, seeing that feminine role model in our life does nothing but make us more well-rounded. Yeah. Um, so that's that's been something that you know both me and you have been able to see and learn from. Yeah, and it's a it's a nice thing when you get around people that understand. There's uh, I don't know how they get in the process of saying a dysfunctional family. I don't think it's such thing as a dysfunctional family unless they do dysfunctional things. 
Absolutely. A perfect family is not two parents, two no. kids, a dog, and a, you know. The, and there's no such thing as a life. perfect family. Let's no, be honest there's there. There's no such thing as anything perfect. No. So, you know, but it's just one of those things where, you know, I was given what was needed for me mm-hmm. to, 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 you know, to progress, <laughs> you know, to evolve, as we always talk about. But that's, that's probably the, the, I guess, the greatest thing that I have, and I'm thankful for that, you know. But yeah. I ha- I've had to learn, you know, how to be. I'm thankful for my uncles. Because, you know, some of those things, you know, the, you know, being a male and, and the things that you had to learn to do and how to do it, you know, it may be a delayed reaction in learning that, you know, you're supposed to do this. But, you know, my grandmother would always reach back if you're not doing something, but <laughs> she'd be like, boy, oh, hold that door for somebody. My mom had a hell of a back end. Uh, yeah. She sure did. You know, what did I call it? The old person grip. Like, <laughs> you can't go anywhere. You may be six foot five and, you know. Oh, five. absolutely. You ain't going anywhere when they put that when, grip when they put that grip on you, look at you with those eyes, you're done. You're just you melting. <laughs> Absolutely. You are. It down. Yeah, man, it doesn't get any better than that. You know? No. So, so, Brian, you've done a lot in life. I mean, you've traveled a lot. You've worked all over um, from being an athletic trainer in college, of training athletes, um, to where you're working now. But I want you to kind of tell the story from your perspective of just kind of, you know, your story, your adventure through life where you started, why you started, and where you're at now. Yeah, I, you know, I always think that uh, we're all just a product of our childhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, coming out of, the, you know, the South, being, you know, a young black male in the South, you know, there's things you had to navigate through, you know, and I, I, I was happy to have that security blanket that kept me away from all the, the things that, or the injustices or the, you know, the, 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 the I guess you'd say the, the mean people, the evil things that can surround you sometimes. But it was uh, my childhood kind of developed me and it was able to send me off to college. My grandmother didn't want me to be, you know, stuck in one place. Mm-hmm. She wanted me to see things. So I I was uh, went off to Southern Miss, you know, tough childhood, been a sense, staying with my grandmother and things like that. You know, you know, they're all things that we all go through and you adapt and you learn. So, you know, with the help of her, because, you know, I think sometimes there's some things I would have made through as a childhood. But I further went on to Southern Miss and started out in athletic training. Mm-hmm. And when you can't tape an ankle in like a minute and 30 seconds, they got to get rid of you, you know. So I had to find something else. So I yeah. got into psychology, which they say we go to psychology just to see what's wrong with us. That's exactly right. And, um, but, you know, needless to say, I found out what's wrong with everybody else and not what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, lucky enough, finished, got my bachelor's in psychology and, and um, come back here and work for a year or so. And, uh, Tommy Newman, a real good friend of mine, um, got me a job at a wholesale place and worked there for a while and realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. Now I'd made a few friends at Southern Miss, you know. Um, so one of the one of my buddies called me back and said, We got a graduate assistant spot. Would you like to come back up? Because they knew I, I had the idea of being a sports psychologist. That was the idea of, you know, truly what I wanted to do. But, mm-hmm. And uh so I got a GA spot and you know, and that and I've kind of, you know, it, it makes it tough because you're gathering and everybody think you're, you know, when you're not a player, football player or baseball player or basketball player, being able to go in those spots is just very difficult. Just, I had friends that are just, you know, real supportive people at that time. And um, they got me the GA spot, I walked into the strength and conditioning part of it, and, you know, it just kind of fell into place and it was kind of like what I want to do. And, you know, I achieve certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, you write those things down that you want to do. I want to, you know, undergrad, get a degree, get a graduate degree and things like that. So I, those things will fall into place. But I also want to be a head strength and conditioning coach at okay. a very young age. Needs to say right around 94, um, 95, right at the, the beginning there, one of the, uh, the head strength and conditioning coach was discussing moving on to you know, mm-hmm. and needs to say he did. And, uh, but I was one of the people that they interviewed and I kind of fell into that spot. And they say right before August, of 20, August 18th, my birthday, um, you're the new strength and conditioning coach at Southern Miss. So I'm the new head strength and conditioning coach. At I'm what t- age? 25, 20. 24, 25. Uh, and it was like this thing. It was like, <laughs> what, uh, I'm, I'm going in and I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm responsible for, 18 or 17 to 24 yeah. year olds. And I'm now the figure that they've got to look into. And I'm not a, 
you know, gregarious person, because we talk about this all the time. I was kind of an introvert. I'm the one that got slapped in the back of the head because I couldn't hear anybody because I was too busy stuck in the television. You know, but it was like one of those things. And so all of a sudden, you know, kind of developing and coming out of that shell, you had to, you had to discipline people that were mm-hmm. above your age. And, you know, you, if we probably hung out with you just a little while ago when you were in college yep. and, and things like that. And, and it, it kind of progressed from there. Mm-hmm. You know, we made a few friends and, um, relationships over that time and uh it's just kind of progressed on the move and it, it, and the thing about it is i wanted to travel i didn't want to stay right here because i i, I see that it can you know it can i guess you would say make it claustrophobic you can yeah. be in that bubble and if you don't get a chance to experience people that are not you know part of the south or part of your your, your growing up it can be deeply but progressed on to move get a job at uh tcu well mm-hmm. associate head coach and uh, that was like in the late 90s. And then, lucky enough, a few friends maneuvered around when I, I coach took over a job and I moved on to Tennessee, where I was a assistant <laughs> player for a few years. And you got players working with working for Coach Fullman. I think it was Coach Green, basketball mm-hmm. coach. And, and uh, great players, you know, got to be around great players, you know. They, that's, that's where you kind of get to introduce people like Peyton Manning and things yeah. like that, you know. And previously, Tennessee, I mean, TCU, you got an opportunity to Tom House and Nolan Ryan and uh, Reese and uh, Reed Ryan and people like that. And it just got to be, it developed, you know, you got to. So you've worked with some really big name athletes. I've, I've been, put it like this, I've been around some big name <laughs> athletes. They are, when you get around people like that, mm-hmm. you know, you're not really working with them. You're watching them work. Yeah. Because those people are just like, uh, they're already motivated. It's something they have their goals set. They're, they're driven to do things. And that's kind of one of the things that you see when you get into a place like that. It's like, yeah. you know, in the off season, you know, see Peyton Manning come back to Tennessee and you got, you know, Chad Pennington out throwing off in the fields and things like that. The Damian Thompson, he was mm-hmm. a freshman when I was at TCU. Okay. Um, LT went into the Hall of Fame. So, you know, it's, Slowly progressed, and I moved on to Georgia, which I uh, became the, uh, the associate head and head or director of uh, Olympic sports with basketball, baseball. And that's where I got, you know, ran into Ron Polk, who was the head coach at that time, and mm-hmm. Coach Perno, and, you know, and things like that. And got to travel, you know, because it was like uh, TCU was the West Coast. So, we, yep. you know, they were a mm-hmm. whack at the time. So, you know, Billy Tubbs and things like that, you got to travel. and. You know, the Utahs and uh, New Mexico State. And, uh, you know, it, it was just, you know, it was quite a, a ride there. And, um, you know, got to visit Puerto Rico a couple of times. And then Georgia was just a combination, just a, a big place with a little town atmosphere. Mm-hmm. It was, and it was just, uh, you know, it was, got to experience good music. You know, because they've got the, you know, the, the Athens scene, yep. the good music. And then you got to meet people like Jeff Kepinger, who got honored last weekend as because he played in the league for about 10 years, mm-hmm. which was like one of the most clutch players. Got to be around people like that again, Ron Pope. And, um, I mean, it was just the experience. Ned Yost Jr., or the fourth, which his father is the uh, head coach for the uh, Royals. Mm-hmm. And previously the... So I've got to be around some very successful people. And like we talk about in our struggle, I got a chance to get out there and see things and do things and be around some people like that. Now, sometimes you have a tendency to watch and not adapt and take in things and become that and understand how they, you know, because they haven't struggled so well or they created a, yeah. an avenue or whatever. And you just don't, you don't realize what, how good you had or how blessed you were. What was, what was the biggest thing you learned from being around all those just exceptional athletes? They always knew. It's something about when you get around somebody like that, they had already had, like, it's like they were destined mm-hmm. for whatever they, and you could see it in their eyes, their face. You knew, <clears throat> you know, if I don't do this, if I don't perform this away, I'm not going to achieve my goal. And that was one of the things that people like that just, you know, I mean, I I used to just love the stories that when you sit around and from, you know, and they would tell you stories about 
like Nolan Ryan for one, you know, to get on the bike, he threw like nine no hitters, you know, mm-hmm. threw a couple at, over the age of 40, and, you know, they threw a party after the what you call, and he'd have to go, you know, ride his bike or he'd go work out yeah. because he was set in the way he was doing things and it had made him successful. So he wasn't going to shake out of that. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I, I learned that once they had a system in place and it continued to be, you know, it worked. Yeah. They didn't step out of that. That zone, you know, it was just one of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite Peyton Manning stories was he was he, he was a freshman, right? Mm-hmm. When that first year he played, mm-hmm. his freshman year when he was at Tennessee, he wanted to play so bad. You know, playing college athletics, you go to a ton of meetings, you watch a ton of film because you're studying your opponent. You want to, you know, know what your opponent's doing. You want to know what your opponent's going to do against you. Mm-hmm. So you watch a ton of film, and you go in these meetings with your position. So for him, he went to meetings with the quarterback coach and the other quarterbacks, and they studied the game film on the next opponent. But what Peyton would do, he would get to the meeting so early that he would lock the door to the field house behind him so that all the other quarterbacks – would be late to the meeting and look bad. <laughs> and there he is 30 minutes early looking like the best pupil in the world. But that's how competitive he was. That's how bad he wanted to play. But that, it's funny you say that once I got there, it was like, oh my God, he was a total prankster. Yeah. You have this exterior that you see this guy, <laughs> but you would hear the jokes and the things that it, the stunts that he would pull from the saran wrap on the toilet of his roommate. In oh. I mean, it was just, he was such a prankster, but, you know, everybody gets this exterior of this upright, which is what, what he has to do. I mean, that's, that's uh, yeah. you know, and he wanted to, you know, his legacy was to make sure that his father, you know, was mm-hmm. proud of him. Yeah, I mean, that that, his, that's the way he was on the field. Mm-hmm. But you start to see now the commercials he's doing, the stuff mm-hmm. he's doing, you can see a little more of that real character that's come good. out. Yeah, he had a great sense of humor. They used to tell me it to, like, you know, but when he get back and do and he'd spend time with the managers and things like mm-hmm. that. So it was not something that he thought he was bigger than the rest of the, yeah. the crowd. So that's what made him, you know, that's what made him what he is today, you know. That, that's that's awesome. Yeah. It's it's good to hear that, you know, people with that much success just are well-rounded and grounded like yeah, that. Exactly. Um, and one of the reasons that, you know, a lot of people, they find that groundedness in their life is some of the tests and the struggles they've been through. So you've been on this crazy journey of, you know, a lot of success and a lot of big things going on working at major colleges. I mean, Tennessee in the late 90s was one of the top athletic programs in the country. They had just won the national championship. Exactly. I taking the job the final. I actually, I, I took the job in the February after they had won the national championship. Yeah. And you walk in and that following year, they had like the number one draft by a college. They had more, you know, like five players that went to the, the first round. Mm-hmm. In the first round, so I mean, it was just it was just a sick atmosphere, you know. I yeah. remember, you know, going in there at one time, and uh, and I think it was uh, Belichick. No, it wasn't Belichick. Uh, he was a uh, coach at um, the Ravens. Billings, yeah, that won the uh, world championship there, um, Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> he walks in, and all of a sudden, he says, "Yeah, I always love coming to this dog and pony show." <laughs> because you'd come in and it was just like a, uh, I mean, scout day. It was just that you you would see every big name in the NFL rolling yeah. in there from the Shanahan's. I mean, it, I mean, it was just unbelievable. It was, uh, Fox at that time. Um, I mean, it was just you know you look around and up power and then mm-hmm. people like that were just rolling in there and yeah. we were like, oh my goodness, you know. I remember meeting uh, Jamal Lewis. Yeah, in person. I was like, this is a large human being. And Leonard Little. Oh, my And goodness. those guys, man, they're just, these incredible athletes. This is um, Leonard Little, Al Wilson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Wilson played middle linebacker, right? Yeah. And he was hurt primarily part of the year with the shoulder deal um, during Tennessee. But he was like the uh, total leader of the team. I man. can see that. Former Golden Glove boxer. Hmm. Well, there wasn't much you were going to say to him. No, he said no, you weren't talking back to him. Was, yeah, <laughs> it was like, mind you, that Jamal Lewis was a. Uh, that's where I saw the work ethic that I was talking about earlier. The people that you just don't tell, you know, you mm-hmm. know, you just kind of sit and watch and yeah. let them go and do their thing because he had blown out his knee. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And uh, 
can't remember if Auburn or somebody, but he continued to play during the run through the national championship. And when I got there, he was re, you know, mm-hmm. rehabbing and getting back in the swing of things. <laughs> to see a man take 315 and stick it on his back and do it for 20 reps because he couldn't go heavy because of the knee. Yeah. It's like just, you know, immensely, but he would want it to get back. And he was going to do everything he could. Everything that's power. That. And, you know, and he did, you know, needless to say. But, you know, it was just like that. You see those guys just kind of perform and get back to where they needed to be. You know, mm-hmm. that year we had Travis Stevens, Travis Henry, who was his replacement, you know. Yeah. Which is, you know, funny to say now. Yeah, it was, exactly. It was, a, it was an awesome thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you've seen in other people, but what – what would you say has probably the, been the biggest struggle in your own life? What what is what's something you've been through that was really tough? Um, I look back and it was many traumatic events mm-hmm. because it was always an internal struggle. Okay. I've always had this huge internal struggle with myself, and I just like we said, it goes back to our childhood. I'm chasing, you know, it. Everything kind of fell in place, you know. So it kind of this internal struggle with myself. So I was. I I battle with the idea: Am I good enough to be at Tennessee? Yeah. Am I good enough to be at TCU? Am I good enough to be a head strength and conditioning coach? It was always my self worth, mm-hmm. and up until I wasn't there, that was my struggle. Even when I moved on, I I could see it each time that I moved to a different place. Usually, I was going by myself, you know, and it was like that internal struggle of you know just being in that room by yourself. Oh my gosh, should I be here? Do yeah. I deserve this? Am I worthy of this? So that was usually the biggest struggle. And, you know, after we've conversated, mm-hmm. you know, and I think, you know, over the last year or so, it's been like this thing now. Everything is done for reasons. There are no coincidences, I don't think. But getting back to that point where I understand now that my struggle was within. My demons were, were within, you know. And, and I had tend to be self-destructive mm-hmm. um i get to because i i try to force myself to fail or i wouldn't force myself i was doing things you know because i thought you know i wasn't worthy of this or i'm not you know yeah this is not my you know even though it was like yeah you, you know you bust your butt you've been through this this and this and you, you know this is yeah you know, this is the the, the pinnacle mm-hmm and but no, that wasn't how I look at it. It was an internal battle there, you know. I don't want to see me fail, so I'm gonna do something to, you know. Yeah. And it was like, uh, I I think it was a battle with fear of failure or fear of success. I don't know which one, mm-hmm. but it was a constant struggle between the two. You know, we always talk about that story about the good and evil. You know, which one you feed the most. Yeah. And that's pretty much what happened. I mean, whichever one I fed the most, you know. And it was usually the fear of just fear. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to fail or I didn't want to, you know, but things happen and, you know, traumatic events. And like we talked, I don't, I didn't cope very well. Yeah. When events happen and then with the struggle of, you know, changing jobs and moving and trying to do your own business, I pretty much internally kind of just got self destructive with mm-hmm. my life. You know, I didn't know it. I thought this was just a normal process, yeah. you know. And, um, uh, so, but I, I got to the point where I was like, okay, this is not, you know, this is not good. And mm-hmm. then the death of my grandmother come, come along, which I said that was kind of my foundation. And, um, but I slowly saw the demise right there. So it was always an internal struggle. And now, you know, we've got to this point over the last year and a half and, you know, conversating with you all, I realized that, you know, that struggle that I was in, like, there is something there's success within that struggle. Absolutely. So, you know, it's like getting that, to understand that, you know, this is how you cope with it. Let's go do something, pour that energy into something else, you know. And I look back and it was like, when she passed away, my family and friends, they had, they, they have stuff to pour their self in. I see people that, you know, and I understand then, now, and understand then that if you can pour yourself into, when you have events like that, or use mm-hmm. that as a coping mechanism to pour yourself in, but I think, you know, you know, they pour yourself in their family, they pour themselves in their work, they pour themselves. But I was, I guess, I was so downtrodden or downtrodden that I, you know, I didn't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. 
And I want to brag on you for a minute. Um, <laughs> Brian, you know, he's had so much success. He's dealt with, you know, so much. Um, but he's actually been sober for over a year now. Yeah. And yeah. that's awesome. And that's an accomplishment that, you know, a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. What, and I know we've kind of briefly talked about this, but what was that moment? I call it the sick and tired moment. That moment where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's what it was for me. What was your aha moment that turned that around for you? Well, it's like um, I had tried a couple months previously, just quit drinking. And it was like like right around Christmas prior to it. And I quit. And then it was like New Year's, go out and drink a few and then things like that. But it was like just this urge. I was sick of it and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's. It's like many points within that, you know, it's yeah. like um, relationships with friends. And then I realized and I looked back and I was like, everything that happened with me drinking, it was not a good, nothing good came out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it started out just like football games or going with coaches yeah. and we're hanging out and drink a few, you go home. It started out social. Yeah, just started out a social deal. And it got to the point where, you know, the stresses of every day. Now that I, you know, I work in psychiatric care, it's like, you know, you, you take a part of you that, that, which goes back, like we said, my grandmother, you know, that empathy for just about everything. I take the weight of the world and put it on my shoulders, which mm-hmm. is, that's not my responsibility. Exactly. But I tried to make that my responsibility. And it's just several, when I, when it got where a few relationships, you know, family relationships, uh, friends, where I, I it, it attacked those or, you mm-hmm. know, infested in those, those things. That's where I knew, you know, and so it's like, and I was given an opportunity and that opportunity made me accountable for that. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. You know, I'll be happy to do that. You know, I mean, let's, let's, let's move on to this and let's try this. And, you know, and, and then it got to the point where I feel like, you know, again, I felt like if I did drink, I was letting somebody down, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever you do in the dark, you never know who's looking. Mm-hmm. And I felt that way. In some cases, some people wasn't looking at you like that, but I was feeling that way. Yeah. You know, and it was like, you know, so I made it a point, you know, I did all the things. I went to like the uh, AA meeting and you now I still go if I need to, to, to go and things like mm-hmm. that. But I got to it, my aha moment. I I went into a, they awarded me the opportunity to go to like a counselor. You can go see this person and, you know, we'll, you know, take care of it. And I went and saw a counselor and he virtually, when I walked in the room, not knowing me, you know, and, you know, just knew some of the story of just, you know, growing up in the South. And mm-hmm. He stripped me down, but naked. Just, I mean, emotionally. Yeah. You know, internally just stripped me down and just let me know that you have succeeded and now you feel like a failure because you're not at the pinnacle of your game anymore, mm-hmm. which is not the case. You achieved all these goals, but you have to make new goals. Exactly. You have to create new things. And he just pretty <laughs> much stripped me down. And at that point, I knew he pretty much let me know that you, you probably had a thinking problem, not a drinking problem. Absolutely. And he said, you know, your mind is, you know, it goes 90 to nothing and you're more concerned about your caregiver and this is what you want to do and this is how you, and that pretty much was my aha moment as, as he stripped me down and he's rattling off things about my grandmother. I'm sure your grandmother done this, this, and this, and he was nailing everything like he was a median <laughs> in the room Yeah, and he was just pretty much just, uh, and it, and it just kind of, and then you, you know, at that point, drinking is not your problem. You need to take care of that internal. That's exactly monster, right. Those demons that you know are wrestling within you. You need mm-hmm. to you know give them a few evic- eviction notices. <laughs> Is that playing around in your head? They're written yeah, they space are. where they don't need to be written space. So that was my true aha moment. You know, and you know it's like you can. There's other variables that, but you can throw those in there. And just the, mm-hmm. the fact that I am a person that believe in our relationship because once they're developed and I feed off of you. I feed off of other people. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, it's like we talk about if you surround yourself with people that are go getters, yep. just doers, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and, and, and want to get to another place, then you figure out, hey, this is, 
this is this is where I want to be. And I was I was surrounded by people that or I didn't allow myself to be surrounded by people that I just wanted to be in my own little world because it was like yeah, yeah that internal struggle. But once I realized, no, you can't do any of this alone. <laughs> yeah. And I was in that body blowing myself, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean that's you know, and then you know, when it affects relationships. Yeah, it does. Know? And uh, you know your your friends, your personal relationships, your family. I think that was a point where I realized that you know, no, this is you know, once he stripped me down there, and I realized that you know, and I look back and it always affects. And it got to the point where I always believe that I want to be able to hold a conversation mm-hmm. when I'm 80 years old, sitting off in a room, and we can talk about you know, oh, back then, yeah, we, life, yes. Just go back through that witch call, but I I felt like that uh, I wanted my mental capacity at a late age where you know because I'd seen so many people that have just not been able to function, mm-hmm. you know, out of some kind of addiction. Yeah, you know, and I, I didn't want that to be the case. Mm-hmm. My internal struggles probably been my biggest, and those are turning points in a relationship. So the turning points that kind of change the those are my aha moments. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, that, that kind of so once walking in that room and they just stripped you down, it's like, okay, I got it. You know, grown yep. man crying off in a wood. Yeah, that's not, you know, grown manish. And, you know, we, we say aha moment, but I actually, like, I don't fully believe in aha moments because it has to build up to that okay. moment. Yes. For me, yes. you know, basically the same thing, like, you know, where your vice was. Alcohol, mine was food. Mm -hmm. But pretty much everything you're saying is going along the lines of my story. And my vice was food, but it was because I was insecure, stressed out, dealing with all these internal demons of not being good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a freaking college all American, one of the top centers in the country. Am I still good enough? Like, do I deserve that? Mm -hmm. And I'm having all success, but still battling all these demons inside. So I would turn to food. And you say relationships. I destroyed a lot of relationships in my life because of food, because that was, I didn't want to see people, people see me eating mm-hmm. and I would rather go drown my sorrows in food than be around people because I was miserable. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I truly know that. And that's the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just the, you know, and sometimes I, I think back and it was like my way of, because I was like such an introvert growing up, yep. you know, and, our stories, like we say, are so similar because you know, trying to grow up in a in, a, in the South, even though it was nineties and the coast, the coast anyway was quite progressive. Yeah, you know, it wasn't. You didn't have the, the racial turmoil that maybe you went up twenty minutes north, and you know, and and it was it was this way, but it was that struggle, and you knew it was there. Mm-hmm. And so I battled with that, you know. Um, you know, it's my dialect. Okay, you know, do I have to, you know? Mm-hmm. Do I, you know, you got to be this way. You got to try to do this this way. Instead of sometimes I thought I wasn't actually being me. I was trying to be something else that, you know, that they wanted you to be. Exactly. Or like something that, you know, appeared or break up all the you know, stereotypes, which ain't true anyway. But I just, you know, I wasn't going to be that stereotype. So I was mm-hmm. like those things. And it battled like it's the same thing. Childhood. It's the same thing. That goes back little, to it. The little buck tooth kid, you know, <laughs> spent you know a bunch of money to get the mouth fixed. That's the same thing. I was that little, you know, funny walking buck tooth kid that was trying to fit in and everything. Mm-hmm. And you know, it got to the point where I didn't care about fitting in. And it was athletics, you know, yeah, playing baseball, basketball, football, and being around those people that kind of broke broke the shell. Mm-hmm. Even though I still stayed when I went home and we go play sports, but when I got home, I was still back in my shit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, but it was like that, that was the thing. And it was like, you, you, you look back and you see retrospectives of 2020 and it was just pretty much that. Mm-hmm. And it was just, you know, I, and I truly understand your struggle. <laughs> absolutely. <it> mine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the battle is internal demons, man. It's, 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 it's something that, you know, conquering one's own self is absolutely the hardest battle you'll ever have to face. Yes. Because the battle of the mind is so tough. Controlling those thoughts, controlling those emotions, emotions. not living out of emotion, but living out of logic and thought. It's it's tough. Um, but getting on more of a positive you know, note, I know those of you who are just listening can't see this, but if you're watching on um, video right now, you see this guy. I mean, he's absolutely chiseled from stone. 
In the gym, it's even more ridiculous. I mean, the dude just is the epitome of physical fitness. Um, so you've maintained your own personal health. You've helped others do the same. Um, you've accomplished a lot. You've been a lot of places. How how do you stay motivated? Like it, you know, we talk a lot because it's easy to get initially motivated. Anybody can do something for thirty days. How do you stay motivated though? Being pissed off. <laughs> Okay, explain. And it, it's it's a uh, one. All you have to do is somebody. If you get into a state where now, where I'm, I'm a th- different thought process. Mm-hmm. And once you conquer one of those demons, which you are you ever conquering it? It's a constant uh, process. Uh, yes, it is. And uh, being pissed off at the fact that people say you can't do something, and and allowing yourself being that person that was um, physically fit and always in pretty good shape. And, and it was at one time that I would not even drink alcohol because I did not want to stick it off in my body. I thought my body was a temple, Yep. you know, but that, that can also be pretty narcissistic too, to a certain point, you know, mm-hmm. and understand that things got to be done. But I, I mean, literally <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's the fact as I get older, you know, I'm not a young cat anymore, and it's like just to get progressing to a certain point. But it's just the the initial feeling. Now it's just the feeling that self worth, and like we said, building on it. We talk about the building blocks and mm-hmm. things like that. We li- <laughs> you sent me something last night. Tell me <laughs> think of it. Yeah, I sent you something like one a.m. last night. <laughs> <laughs> and usually he knows that I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to sit up and listen to it. And um, and it, it just it shows that building blocks. I don't have to be prescribed to that building blocks that, that have been set for me because we talked about mediocrity. Mm-hmm. That thing, mediocrity. My my goals in life, I you know, you look back and they were, oh, you could have accomplished much more. But those goals in that situation was, hey, you got to get out of high school. You got to yeah. get a college degree. You got to do this. and. And achieve making forty thousand dollars a year. This is the goal. You had a different story you were telling yourself. Yeah, and when actuality is no, you this bubble was just created to keep people in a certain place. Yep. And 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 now it takes me you know twenty some odd years to realize, hey man, you could have done this, this, and this. Even though I've achieved these things, I look back and I'm oh my god, what I could have achieved if I'd have conquered the mind. But that was the process. It was. That's the journey, and the journey was meant for me to be here. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, you know, you know I just got to get out of that idea that mediocrity is not, you know, that's not, not a place for any of us. No. You know, so our struggle is to get get out of that mindset. Get out of those limiting beliefs. I mean, that's that's one of the things I've always struggled with. <clears throat> you know, even doing some of the stuff that I'm doing now, mm-hmm. I still have those limiting beliefs that stop me from really attacking it like I should. And, you know, I can look back at my life and say that, you know, a lot of things that I could have done, I didn't do Mm -hmm. because of those limiting beliefs. And it just held me back. And, you know, growing up, the introverts and battling those demons and those issues that we've both had, you know, those limiting beliefs are strong. Man. And they take such an effort to get past them. It's it's a daily effort. It's not something that you can do and just be done with. It's, it's not like, you know, an exercise program you can do for 30 days is done. Yep, exactly. It's a constant daily battle dealing with those limited beliefs. And, you know, the thing is, the thing that's good about, you know, working on limited beliefs is you start to really wrap your mind around the possibilities. Because once you can identify those limiting beliefs, on the flip side of that, you start identifying what else is out, out there. there. And you start identifying, hey, you know, if I get rid of that, I can really do this. Exactly. If I stop thinking this way, I can probably make this impact. And I, I think that's the light that's really coming on in you. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, one of the conversations we've had before, you talked about, you know, and I, I heard you say this, and I know the feeling as soon as you said this, <laughs> and you just like, it slapped you in the face, your own words, when you said, I've already accomplished all my goals. And when I heard you say, I'm like, oh my goodness, I saw that expression on your face. You're like, Did I, and I'm not done. I have so much more I want to do. And it was like an aha moment right then and there mm-hmm. that it just like a light bulb went off. And you were just thinking like, I have so much more 
I want to do. And, you know, that's kind of what I see in you. And I, I see this tremendous potential because of everything you've done, because of your wisdom, your knowledge. And to see you have that light bulb moment, I was like, yes. It was funny that I, I, and I know when you're talking about it, you know, invited me to hang out with a few people, a few mm-hmm. friends of his, and I'll um, get out there. And, I, and as it come out of my <laughs> mouth, I was thinking to myself, have you lost your mind? <laughs> And it was just one of those moments where you're right. It was just a total black. Uh, and you're looking at me like, did he say what I said? <laughs> he said? And I was like, yeah, I said it. And then, I, you know, you have to retract. And I thought to myself, yeah. I mean, I have a piece of paper where I wrote down these things on in, in, in college. Mm-hmm. Coming out of high school, I wrote these things mm-hmm. down on a piece of paper. And I achieved them. And it's like, you know, and it was like, you know, after being a head strength and conditioning coach, it was like awarding my job to allow me to travel yep. and do this. And it allowed me to, you know, many places, Mexico, Puerto Rico, you know, um, 30 some odd states. And, you know, and it was just like, OK, yes, I did say that. And now then it dawns on me, oh, my goodness, now I've got to write something else down. And it's another. and. No, I'm not done. I, you know, there's things, and I don't know exactly what those, mm-hmm. where that journey is going to lead me, but within this structure, which I was, I mean, you know, and you know how happy I've been about just the, or enthusiastic and, you know, yeah. excited about just the, I guess the new relationships mm-hmm. that have been formed over the last year. So it's just like the amazing thing to think, hey, man, you got so much more that you want to give. It was always that thing. That was one of the goals. And I, it was like, oh, my goodness. But I never wrote them down, which was a big mistake. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I wanted to be successful as a philanthropist. wanted to give to, you know, we talked about schools and things like yep. that. And, and just being able to just offer, you know, understand that, you know, giving that, that, that kid, you know, that little kid that impoverished and, you know, was that back in my day they were called latchkey kids. Yeah. Right? Yep. <laughs> And but given those opportunities to do things and be places and, and give them the tools, give them the hope and, where yeah, they don't yeah, have exactly. it. Because probably like me and you, yeah. a lot of times we felt hopeless. A lot of times we felt like there's just no way. And and, and the thing about it is that I always get this, uh, man, you're always smiling. You're always smiling. This is yep. whatever. I, it's a mask. Mm-hmm. You know, and people don't understand, you know, yeah, you smile. To hide the pain. Uh, it's a, it's a facade. Yeah, a facade that you put up. But it, it, it that was a coping mechanism. And the more that we mm-hmm. talked, I'd understand hey, this is, that, that, that big old smile was a coping mechanism to get me through Absolutely. the day. And, uh, you know, and I genuinely, you know, if I was smiling, it was genuinely meant. But, you know, when I got back to the house, this was this battle with those internal Ooh. demons that, you know, would overtake you. But, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times, like, you know, you're putting on this facade out in public of this person of who you want everybody to see you as and this positive person. But inside, you're really a prisoner of your own thoughts. Exactly. You're letting those negative thoughts and feelings and emotions just consume you. And you look great on the outside, but inside there's just raging battle mm-hmm. going on that, you know, unless we're open about and talk to people about, nobody knows. And being an introvert, we we just dealt with those problems. Yep, we exactly. just said, you know what? I'm dealing with this. I'm going to deal with it. I'll put a band aid on it. And move on. I I, could, I think back to college and got to graduate school, and I remember bringing in a, a one. I, I walked around I, one of the graduate assistants, mm-hmm. you know, which I became roommates with when we moved to um, when I moved to Dallas. But it was like I'd walk around you know campus. I had been on there four years, you know, and I'd worked in the intramural department and you know referee games, played in intramurals and. You know, before I you know, took the job as a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach. But he walked around and I was speaking to everybody and whatever. And he just looks at me and he says, you sure you're not a politician? <laughs> Shaking hands and kissing babies. So he, he coined me Governor Brown. And I was like, if you only knew. My friends call me the politician too. <laughs> That's bad. I do know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, okay. 
And then all of a sudden you look back and it was like, man, if you knew the internal struggles that were going in once the doors were closed or you were in, you know, in that office, the battles that you were taking, you know, it was like you were in a battle every day. Yeah. But the thing is, like, people understand is it's because of our love for people that we look like a politician because we genuinely care about everybody Mm -hmm. else. And it's easier for us to care and help other people than to do it for ourselves. So that's why we look like politicians because we genuinely care and want to help everybody. And we're going to smile and be friendly and talk to everybody. So we don't have to deal with our own crap. Exactly. And it's, it's an easier process for us. Exactly. But on the inside, you know, we're still struggling with those demons. demons. And it's, 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 you say that I, um, my junior year, I had a new roommate in college mm-hmm. and, uh, my father was a, a, uh, preacher. And, um, I think it was Crystal Springs, maybe Mississippi. Okay. And I, he would always say, how in the world do I smile? And he was like one of those people that I did get to have those relationships where you conversate with mm-hmm. in the middle of the night. But he would always ask me some weird questions. Yeah. And, you know, we're sitting up there one night, and he asked me, it's like, you know, I never really saw any black people when I was in Australia. It's like, okay. Random. Yeah. So he just... Pretty much put it in context that he would, went on a mission. He didn't see many when he was in Crystal Springs. There weren't a lot of congregational people that he was around. And, um, but he just, you know, but it was like this idea, mm-hmm. you know, and this belief system. And when actuality, you know, it's like, you know, I believe the same. I'm no different from you and this and that. And being raised by this old black lady in the South, you know, real religious, mm-hmm. stone Baptist Christian, but she was, Progressive. Yeah. And so, you know, may, you know, they beat you and send you to church on, and, you know, <laughs> and you wear that cross for I don't know how long, you yep. know, and, you know, growing up on the coast, it was a Catholic and you have the Baptist and there's a church on every corner. Yep. But it was like this cross that you wore. But my grandmother had this thing. She would say, just love people. Amen. The rest will take care of itself. And I, and it just, and, I, and it was ingrained in me. <laughs> and, uh, it just continued on in college and like that. But I, that internal struggle, like you said, yeah, I smile and I, and I genuinely, you know, and that was another thing that as you develop, you also know that, you know, you, you, you become so passionate that you, you hurt now because when your friend hurts, you hurt and you take on their struggles, but you also have the internal struggles that you're battling with. And now you got to learn to compartmentalize those things yep. and try to take it. And it took me 25, 26, Year, I realized that up until this point, maybe last year, mm-hmm. I realized, wait a minute, take care of your own kitchen, mm-hmm. take care of your own stuff, and then you you're more equipped to help those, absolutely, you know. And that's 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 you know, and it it, it you look back and that like we always talk about, you know, if I'd have listened to her, <laughs> if I'd have listened to what she was saying, or if I could grasp what she was saying, I could understand it more. I'd be in a much better place. But mm-hmm. you know, I. I but I still think now we are more equipped to help now yeah. than we ever were at that time. Yeah. You know, or mature, whatever they want to call it. But, you know, it's just like a, a ability to do that is getting getting better and it's a work in progress. It absolutely is. I always say I'm under construction. We're under construction. We are. We are. I mean, so, and unless you're under construction, I think you're dying. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's, that's one thing Never about, learning. you know, Never learning. yeah, the people I surround myself with and you do the same thing. Mm-hmm. We surround ourselves with what Jason Silva calls a seeker. Those who are constantly seeking knowledge, knowledge. seeking to expand their mind. Right. Um, and, you know, one of the things about doing that is me and you both love philosophy. Yes. We love philosophy, love, you know, just getting inside the mind, the way things work. And in that world, you're not dealing with a lot of Christians. Let's be honest. No, you're not. So, you know, coming from that background, and we both still are, what We've come to believe, and you get so many negative stereotypes about Christianity and the judgmental side of it, and which, you know, some of it is true. It is. There are a lot of judgmental people in religion, and, you know, let's be honest, religion is probably the number one cause of war through history. Yes, it is. But the way that I believe in my faith is just love on people, man. That's it. I mean, being Christian is being Christ-like. What did he do? He, he, just, he just loved on people. That's all he did. Yeah. He didn't judge them. He didn't talk about them. He just loved on people. And, hey, when 
their final day comes, they'll be judged then. Mm -hmm. But until then, just love on a man because that's, that's how I've been able to affect a lot of people. And that's how I've been able to help a lot of people is just, I just love on a man. You know, if if they're doing something negative, I'm like, well, Hey, look, you're going through that, but let's find the silver lining. Let's move forward. Let's just make the best out of this. Uh, As you can see, I always smile when something pops up in the head. But it's like, uh, I think about I got a friend that always says to me, why do you like that person? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes people have done things to you or they say things behind your back and you just, you know, it's it's easier. Yeah, it is. It's not, why, you know, harboring anger? (laughs) It's hard, man. It is. It's destructive. I mean, boy. It can consume you and eat your very soul. And, you know, in a long period of time, I mean, especially after the death of my grandmother, she passed away of cancer and a battle. You know, my uncle did it last year. And I know I couldn't have coped with that if I hadn't quit drinking. It had been another one of those things. That blackening of your soul Mm -hmm. because of things like that. And it's much easier to just love people because it's like some people do things to you and they don't know they do them. Exactly. You know, and their response to all these, they, they don't understand that we are such emotional people that, yes. you know, just to, just to do something to me. And that's why I envy, which I shouldn't envy, some people that, you know, we talk about some of us, the, the guys that we look at and the speakers that you send up. There's one or two of them now there. I don't care what you think. Yeah. You know, this is what you could be and this is what you could do, you know, but, that's not how we build. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, but there are many ways to attack certain things and get things done. And I and I truly believe that it soothes my savage beast to be more, you know, kind in those things. You know, in situations where, you know, uh, yeah, people done things to you and, yeah. and said things. And okay, uh, it's much easier for me to keep you closer than to let you, you know. Mm-hmm. So I just soon love them as opposed to, you know. Yeah, and a lot of people ask me, you know. When things go wrong or when things happen, how I'm able to stay calm and stay, you know, in a positive mood, even though the world's crumbling around me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I simply tell them, you know, if it's a person that's doing something to me, the only time I'm going to get aggravated with that person is if it's intentional. Mm -hmm. If they're intentionally doing something to hurt me, then I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. If they did something without knowing or, you know, didn't even think about it, okay, yeah. You, you hurt me or whatever, but I understand that you didn't intentionally do it. So let's just talk about it. Let's move on. Or, you know, if something happens in your life that you can't control, there's no point in getting mad about it. You cannot get angry about it because getting angry does not solve problems. Getting in that emotionally driven mindset does nothing but make things worse. So get out of that mindset and actually solve the problem. We're just getting angry about it. Actually solve the problem. And in most cases, the problem solves itself if you have the ability to just, yeah. hey, this, okay, you've done this, we said this, and okay, now mm-hmm. you can either feel bad about it, don't care, or move on. We can either, you know, come together yep. and move out of this process, or hey, let's just, you know, move on to the next situation or move on to the next, you know, but it, it, it tends to be, we tend to let it consume. I, 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 um, we always talk about stuff we've read. And one of the mm-hmm. books I read was The Way to Freedom by Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, I'm not sure if that's the correct title, but it's it talked about suffering, which is always talked about within that religion. And instead of just accepting the suffering, allowing it to, you know, it take care of itself. Yeah. And you're working towards because, you know, without suffering, you know, there's no... Success in anything you do with without it. the lows, you can't you experience, experience highs. highs. Yeah, exactly. And so that's that's pretty much where you know, hey, these things happen. And I have a tendency, had a tendency, which I'm getting truly better at, of living in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. and I would just live there, and it affected the present. It affects the future. It affects everything. I'm not worthy, like we talked about. I'm not worthy of doing this. I'm not worthy of doing that. Yep. And because this happened to me in the past, or I thought this way, or, you know, these, you know, it, it, it just, it, 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 it means you, it, it, I mean, your whole body, you mm-hmm. ache from just those thoughts, you, do. you know, you do. And, um, but yeah, and I'm more learning now. This is the present. 
the present and we're moving on and we got to, you know, and, and like we, we talked about the other night, sometimes we try to put ourselves in the future too fast instead of just letting things happen. And I'm mm-hmm. getting more help, amped into just taking and staying right here in the present and just enjoying the moment. You yep. know, and not only, you know, seeing the flowers, smelling them and all that good stuff. That's exactly right. So last question, um, just for the viewers and listeners out there, what would you say is the biggest, most important lesson, one lesson you've learned at this point in your life? Well, I think one of the, and that pretty much sums it up right there, you know, but the, we talked about, uh, I think it was a quote, and I'm not sure who, who, who wrote it right now, but uh, in school, you're given the lesson and then the test. But in life, you know, you're given the, the test, test and then the lesson. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you you know, you're you're going to run into things that happen, okay, and hence the lesson, <clears throat> you know, so. Now, you, you know, you got to learn from those things that happened in the past and make sure you, you know, you lead it in a direction that it doesn't, ha- doesn't happen again. Or if it does, you're better equipped to handle it. You exactly. know, because I say the same thing about relationships. You go in and out of relationships and things like that. Things are going to happen. But if you're better equipped to handle situations, you know, if this person is conducive to you or if you're somebody that needs to be in with those, the, you know, that person, mm-hmm. or those people, you know, because you're going to run into <clears> a lot of, it's like we talked about people being around people that elevate. Yeah. I understand that I put myself in a place where I was around a good bunch of good people. They wasn't raising, you know, you got to put yourself around game changers. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to be a game changer and you want to be a part of certain things, you've got to put yourself around people that elevate you. If I'm, in the, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. room. That's right. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's like, I always go back to Ray Charles. You know, I could play country dumb with the best of them. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, I, I can always be thinking of myself sometimes as being that old yeah. lawyer that walks in there and says, I just, you know, help, talk to me like I'm a sixth grader. So, but I did that to reduce, you know, mm-hmm. that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Or I just took that mediocrity, but I mean, it's the point now that, you know, no, you got to surround yourself with people that know way more than you do. Just like we talked about, I'm not very good at the business part of anything, you know, um, but I love people. Yep. And I am just, you know, I'm, I'm back to being me. That's the thing that, you know, because I can see where back when I was younger, I was like, you know, I mean, they used to be jokes, you know, because mm-hmm. I'd win t-shirts and do something that I'd give to this kid or something like that or hand him yep. this or give him this and it's like, there, go BB again. You know, it's, you know, and then you go play softball somewhere, and I'd end up over in the corner, and I'm playing with all the kids. Mm-hmm. And so, but it was just a, it, it, but I feel more that I'm coming back to that place yeah. where I just enjoy the, uh, the, and it's not a drinking setting, or it doesn't have to be a social event, you know. It's more authentic. Authentic, you know. And, and back then, it was authentic, and I'm back to being authentic. Yeah. Where it's not just a facade that you have to put on the cover of all that, <laughs> that, that, that you know, all them people in your, all them demons inside that you're allowed to play around in your head and, mm-hmm. you know, hitching your soul. So yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's pretty much, I just, just understanding that there will be lessons. You know, yep. you gotta learn from the it. test was already there. So the lessons you've got to learn from and continue mm-hmm. to understand that, you know, this is going to happen and let's, let's, uh, let's move on from it. Let's, Absolutely. Let's raise the level. Let's, let's just put another brick in the wall. Absolutely. <laughs> And, you know, I want to take the time now to thank you. Thank you for being who you are, because in the short time that we've known each other, I mean, you've influenced my life. I see I see the way that you interact with people. I see that genuine love you have for people. And it's it's a real rare quality in today's world. We're so negative and so cynical. You know, the whole world's looking for you to fail. But you see the best in people. You love on people. And you're always there. If somebody needs you, whether it's on social media, they're reaching out to you or in person, you're there for them. So I want want to thank you for your just genuine love 
and the way you help people. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, it's like it, you don't see those things. It's like you say, you know, you, it's just a physical thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't see those things. It's just now that I'm identifying with certain things. I got laugh about my triceps. And <laughs> But, you know, I truly appreciate it because I, I assumed, which is a bad thing to do, that everybody was like that. In actuality, it's not the case. No. And, uh, but I, I truly appreciate it. I've enjoyed the friendship that we've, uh, you know, it has uh, grown over a short period of time. It has. Because we're, we're dealing the same struggle. Yep. We're in the same struggle every day. And it's nice to be around game changer. I understand, you know, it can't be different, you know, mm-hmm. but, you know. It, uh, I appreciate it. Absolutely. And to you, the same. <laughs> to you, the same. It's been Thank a beautiful you. thing just in, you know, just the relationships that you've had that you allowed me to be a part of and uh, kind of changed my, you know, thought process. I understand there are good people and we can do good things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, it's, but you can't do it alone. No, you cannot. The great words of Maya Angelou, no one, no one out here can make it alone. That's That's exactly right. So, Wrapping up, guys, thank you for checking out the show today. As always, to find out more, check out my website, RobbieDeAngelo.com. Follow Brian on social media. Guys, always putting out just insights and great things to read. Um, On most of the social media, it's Brian Keith Brown. Um, Check out my social media as well, at Robbie D'Angelo on most of them. Please leave me a note. Leave both of us a note. We'd love to hear from you. Like and subscribe to anything. Um, this is your friend in the struggle, Robbie D'Angelo, with my amazing guest, Brian Brown, proving to you the struggle is real. We are strong. Yes, we are. <laughs>